you. Thank you for this opportunity for me to share my story with you. So, as my title said, um, changing the world two breaths at a time. And the reason why I named my talk that is because I am a breast cancer scientist, but I was also diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 37 years old. And one might ask, how could a woman who is educated about breast cancer, thinks about it every day, and works on it, could be diagnosed with a late stage breast carcinoma? Well, the answer is that nobody is exempt from breast cancer. In fact, breast cancer affects one in eight women. One in eight women in the United States will be diagnosed with breast cancer sometime during her lifetime. But unfortunately, I am the one in that statistical equation. But bad things do happen to everyone, and it's a matter of what you do with those experiences that define you as a person. And so I'm trying to use this tragedy of having breast cancer to put it towards making me a better scientist. So I was born and raised in the Midwest, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and I got my first taste of, being, of science working in a lab when I went to school at Washington University in St. Louis. And that is where I realized that I wanted to get my PhD in molecular biology. And so I went to the University of Iowa and um, in the PhD program, and that's where I met my husband, Paul. Paul's advisor and mine are married to each other. He worked for the woman and I worked for the man. And we met over a happy hour drinking beer, talking about science, you know, it was totally romantic. And um, we got married. And um, eventually, according to our parents, we finally graduated. And it was time for us to go and do a postdoctoral fellowship. Now, postdocs to PhDs are very similar to a residency for a medical doctor in that it's, you're not really ready to head your own lab, get your own funding, and completely be in charge of your research. And so we went out to the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, and we both did um, fellowships. And it was there that I got interested in studying breast cancer. I worked in a lab, Dr. Ira Paston's lab, and they were very good at targeting single cell cancers like lymphomas and leukemias. And I wanted to apply this technology to a solid tumor, breast cancer. And so that is where I started um, my research in breast cancer. And then what you do is when you get a job, you then take your breast cancer or your research program with you and use that to seed your own research program when you become like a professor somewhere at a university. So um, out when we were in Washington, D.C., it actually, um, we were there during 9-11. And that was a pretty scary time, considering Paul and I were both working on a government compound. But we also um, had our daughter, Claire. So Claire was born in Washington, D.C. And here in Sioux Falls, she is very proud of that fact, that she was born in D.C. Is that true, Mama? Yeah, yeah, that's true. But anyway, so um, Paul and I eventually, of course, finished our training. And it was time for us to get our first real job. And Paul wanted to be a teacher at an undergraduate um, college. He is from the Midwest, and Augustana College was hiring a microbiology professor. And he's a microbiologist, and so it was a perfect fit. I was very fortunate to get a job with what is now called Sanford Research, and I'm part of the Cancer Biology Research Center. And I was the first cancer scientist to come here and to help establish that um, center. So life was good. We're starting our careers, and um, I get pregnant with my second child, and we had Clark. And I nursed Clark for about a year, and I was actually scheduled to go out to a national meeting in California um, after a year. I finally, you know, pulled him away and say, okay, we got to stop now. Um, and I noticed after several weeks that I had a lump in my right breast, that my breast didn't dry up like the left one, and it was definitely a problem. And, you know, and I tried to hand wave it and be like, well, you know, there's a lot of hormones and you have fibrous tissue um, after you're done nursing. Maybe it's a cyst. You know, fluid is never a bad thing. It could just be a cyst. But down deep inside, I knew that something was definitely wrong. And I called and I made that appointment to have a mammogram and I was 37. And actually, it'll be four years on Tuesday, June 
14th. And the reason why I remember that so well is because it's my husband's birthday, which I kind of ruined that day. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but anyway, so I went in to have my mammogram, and I stood proud and tall, and uh, digital technology, and you know, I'm gonna do this, I'm taking care of myself. And of course, needing the data as a scientist, I have to run over when the monitor shows the image to see what it says. And I was like, oh man, that thing's huge. So um, I called Paul and he ran over. He was actually teaching students at Augustana. Um, and he came like immediately. I called my mother and I remember telling my mom that I thought, I thought that I was gonna die. And the situation is very hard. Paul and I, we had a biopsy done, or I guess I did. <laughs> Paul held my hand. <laughs> so I had a biopsy done. And, um, and then the story goes, you wait. That's what Paul and I learned about cancer, is you wait. So we waited for the results from the biopsy. We set up surgery. I elected to have a bilateral mastectomy, and then I had um, chemotherapy and radiation. And it took a couple weeks to coordinate um, the surgeons because I was also having reconstruction done. And so I sat there waiting for surgery to come. And of course, I had to go into work because you know I love science. And I was looking at breast cancer samples because that's what I study. And I kept thinking, oh my gosh, does my cancer look like this? Does my cancer have that protein? And it was really, really tough to focus on my research. And so I thought to myself, you know, tissue is the most precious gift that we can give to science. I can study models, tissue culture, cells, as much as I want. But unless what I learn goes back and is applicable to the patient, it, it just cannot be translated into the clinic. And so I decided that I was going to give my tissue to science. And I went and talked to the path lab, and I said, um, you know, take what you need for diagnostics, but please save the surgical waste. Don't throw anything away. And so we had my, um, the cancer tissue was paraffin embedded, paraffin's wax, so it's like a little block of wax with the tumor in it. And then um, we had the normal, tissue frozen, because frozen tissue is very valuable. You can do a lot more with it. But, but anyway, so I get this all set up. And, and, this, and the story goes that my lab manager and student are on call while I'm in surgery. And then the path lab is going to call them up, and then they're going to go over with their bucket of dry ice. And then the tissue would be ready, and they would give it to them, and then they would go and freeze it in liquid nitrogen. OK? But it was. Um, many weeks until I was told the full story of, of what happened that day. So I, of course, had, was under um, anesthesia in surgery, and um, they called my lab and told them the tissue's here, but they hadn't like grossed in my sample yet. And so when my student and lab manager got there, there was my breast, nipple side down, sprawled out on the path bench. And my student goes, whoa, my boss was really well endowed. <laughs> <laughs> so these kind of experiences really brought my lab um, together. And it's amazing <laughs> the things that we can share and talk about. But I thought that was pretty funny. But anyway. So after surgery, you wait to start chemo. And then I had eight chemotherapy treatments. And chemo is, was the lowest point in my entire life. It's you start trying to feel normal, and you get poisoned with the therapy, and it keeps putting you down. And then you wait, and then they give you more, and you just keep going down further and further and further. And you can never get yourself back up to feeling normal again. And I was always asking questions like, is the chemotherapy working? Are there cells in my body still? Do I even need this chemotherapy? And if so, is it killing them? And no one can give you that answer because we just don't know. We just have to do everything we can to try to increase your odds of not having a recurrence. And so I decided that statistics are for populations and not an individual. Really, I have a 100% chance of being cured or I have a 0% chance. So I decided I was taking the 100% chance of being cured because, well, it's free, 
and it's a much better way to live your life. And the other thing about chemotherapy is it taught me to ask for help and to let people help you. It was very difficult, I think, to let people help me because it would be that I would have to admit that I needed the help. And my husband now has two little kids and a sick wife. And he was, you know, carrying the heavy load of all the work around the house. And um, my students and his students and our neighbor and friends would bring us food. They'd bring us dinner. And I was always like, Paul, why do these people keep bringing us food? Do they not think we can take care of ourselves? And Paul's like, Christy, I can't. I can't do everything. I can't take care of the kids and you and make dinner every single night. We need that help. And I was like, all oh, right, right. <laughs> you know, I was tired all the time. I, you know, and I was thinking, oh, so really when, you, when you're helping a patient, you're really helping the whole family because everyone always says that cancer doesn't just affect the patient. So, you know, chemotherapy did finally end. And of course, then I had to wait to start my radiation. And I had 33 radiation treatments. Um, you have radiation every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. But then you have the weekend off. And your body needs that time to heal. Um, and during this whole process, I just wanted to be a good mom. I went from holding Clark close and nursing him and holding him to not wanting him anywhere by my chest because it was sore and I didn't want him to accidentally kick me. And I wasn't allowed to pick him up for six weeks after surgery. What do you do with a one-year-old? Well, you pick them up, you change their diaper, right? You put them down and then you pick them up and you hold them and cuddle them. So it was very hard. And my husband, once again, had to pick up that role. And he and Clark bonded. And I'm grateful for that. But sometimes I get a little jealous because if Clark's walking along and he falls and he scratches his knee, he, you know, daddy, daddy. And it's like, no, no, you want mama, you know. <laughs> However, in the middle of the night, Clark screams daddy. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you want your daddy, you know. <laughs> but anyway, when I was finally feeling better, I um, went to the path lab and I got, got my tumor. They had kept it for me and, and saved it. Um, and I finally held my own tumor and I felt powerful. And for the first time I felt like I was in control. And I keep this paraffin embedded tumor in my office, in my drawer. And I know that sounds a little crazy, but I like it there. And once in a while, I'll take it out. <laughs> and I know a lot about that tumor and that cancer and the characteristics, and sometimes we'll, we'll actually use it to optimize a certain experiment or procedure. Um, so going back to my experience going into my research, I now have experienced the other side of breast cancer research as being the patient. So I know the questions that cancer patients are asking, but I also understand the limitations of science. But I'm, I'm focusing my research on trying to find answers for the questions that I asked during my experience. And it's been direct, directing my research program. We're trying to design an early blood test for breast cancer. We are taking advantage of the immune system. So our immune system is very smart. It continually surveys our body, and it can tell the difference between a normal cell and a cancer cell. And when the body finds something that's not self, it elicits a response, and it's an amplified response, where a single cell could make thousands of molecules to signal that something is wrong. So if we can tap into this response, we would be able to detect cancer a lot sooner. The other goal of my research program is we want to find new proteins on the surface of cells that we can use for targeted therapies. And the idea is, is that these proteins would be on the surface of cancer cells, but it would not be on your normal essential tissues. So therefore, we could use the protein as a target. The drugs would find the cancer and kill it, but yet your normal essential tissues would still be fine. So it's um, been a very long road to recovery. 
And I find now that as part of my journey, it was the waiting and always the time that went into everything. And I started to get kind of philosophical in my thinking after this whole journey. And I started thinking that we fight against time our entire lives, yet really, time is our biggest advocate. Time is what heals our bodies. And time is what defines your cure. As a matter of fact, the way that you are cured of breast cancer is if they cannot detect cancer cells in your body for five years. Once you hit five years, now I guess you can wear the t-shirt that says, I'm cured. So I will be five years out next summer, and I'm going to be first in line to buy that t-shirt. The other thing is that this whole experience happened when I was young in my career and starting out, and I have young children. And I know that with time, you can never get that time back, nor can you work hard enough to ever make up the gap. But today is here, and I have the time today. And I'm going to enjoy life, and I'm going to work hard but I will always have an exciting experiment planned for tomorrow. Thank you.